Well, if you were here last week, you know that we looked at Luke chapter 10, and I'm not quite ready to leave that. So we're going to stay right in Luke chapter 10 this morning. You might recall that Jesus had sent out the 72, and they had come back to report the experience they had. We talked about this transition that takes place in Luke. Right here, um, Luke has been recording for the last nine chapters the evidence that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. And he offers lots of proof inviting you to believe that. And then Luke records Jesus sending out these 72 ahead of him as he's on his way to Jerusalem. And if you've been in church very long, you know what's going to happen in Jerusalem, right? We just actually were reminded of it, the sacrifice of Jesus, his death upon the cross. And so Jesus is on his way, but these ambassadors of the kingdom go out and spread this news bringing a blessing into people's homes, into their lives, healing the sick. And they come back and they are excited and report back to Jesus the joy that they've had in spreading this message of the kingdom of God. And right there, Jesus says, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. I think maybe what comes after these verses is a continuation of the same theme of Jesus sending out and announcing the kingdom of God and inviting people to believe the evidence that he's offered. And so as these messengers come back and report their joy that people have responded to this message of the kingdom of God in anticipation of the arrival of this Messiah. Luke continues in chapter 10, this same idea, this message of the kingdom, are you going to accept it? Are you going to believe it? Are you coming in to the kingdom of God? And so the rest continues that theme. And so Luke says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. 
Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Now you know this story, right? If you've been around very long, you know the story of the Samaritan. Jesus cast the Samaritan, who in his time, the religious elites considered to be unclean, sell out half Jews, traitors to the kingdom of God, unworthy to hear the message of the kingdom of God. In some cases, calling them dogs. There is not a lower class than the Samaritan, except because Jesus reverses the roles. If you need some help, there's a Samaritan hospital. And in fact, because Jesus reverses the roles, if you pull out your quick app on your phone and look up the definition of a Samaritan, it will not tell you religious sellout, traitor, unclean, a dog. It will instead, instead tell you a charitable and helpful person. The number one definition. Because Jesus reverses. Because in the kingdom of God, there is a transformation. And Jesus asks a question of this teacher of the law. Who was this man's neighbor? The priest? Sworn to represent God before the people? A Levite, charged with caring for those in need? Or a Samaritan? I imagine um, that guy wanted to find a lifeline and call a friend. He didn't want to give the answer, but he did, a Samaritan. And the command of Jesus Go and do likewise. And then Luke continues. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This uh, famous encounter too, are you familiar with this one? I always felt like it was a little bit unfair. I felt like Martha gets a bad rap. And she gets her name called twice. Maybe Jesus didn't know her middle name. Martha, Martha. Because if it had been me, it had been Troy Nicholas. Martha, Martha. I'm, I understand why she gets a little bit of a hard time. I, I get the feeling. Luke tells us in the text that she was taking care of the things that needed to be done. And Jesus reorients her thinking and says, there is only one thing needed. Odd that those are paired together. Martha consumed by the things that need to be done. And Jesus saying, there is only one thing needed. And Mary has chosen that. And it's not going to be taken from her. I think Luke is raising a question. And so it just hangs there. As you're reminded to think about the Samaritan and being instructed to go and do the same. And then Martha, all these things that need to be done. And I think the question hangs there. What's distracting you? from the thing that's most important. 
What's distracting you from the advance of the kingdom of God in your own life? What's pulled your attention away? And I think without missing a beat, because you've got to remember, parchment and scrolls are expensive. He's not dividing them into chapters. He's just continuing the story. So as that question hangs there, what's distracting you? We, we read words we've already heard this morning. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Here's the flow. 72 ambassadors of Jesus go out pronouncing the kingdom of God is near. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. The Messiah is coming. And they bless people in their homes, report back to Jesus. They're ready for your arrival. And they're overjoyed. People responded to the message, Jesus. They're ready for your arrival. And then Luke writes two quick stories. One about a man who says, hey, what do I need to do? Well, you've been to church, right? So, so what do you know? Jesus asks. That's what he asks. Well, I need to love the Lord, and I, I need to love my neighbor. And in case you're looking for wiggle room, Jesus tells a story. Do you know who your neighbor is? Anyone you come in contact with who has a need. I don't know if you're aware of this. Do you know of anybody who's fallen into the hands of robbers? See, if the Apostle John was here, he would immediately jump out of his seat and say, I know! The thief comes to steal and kill. Do you know anyone who's fallen into the hands of robbers? Who is your neighbor? You need to be like the Samaritan. Jesus tells that story. Then Martha, she's on the inside. This is Martha, whose brother Lazarus was dead. What greater honor could there be than to host the Lord in your home? To take Him in and serve Him. And yet, being wrapped up in all the service deprives her of the one thing that she needs. Did you see what it was in the text? To sit at the feet of the Lord. To hear His voice. To be in His presence. I think Luke is asking you to think about have you prepared? Have you welcomed this Messiah in? Are you loving the Lord? Are you in His presence? Are you listening to His Word? And has that changed you? Are you more like the Samaritan than you are the priest and the Levite? 
Have you been transformed? And in case you haven't, Luke records one more story. What do you do about it? If you have a need, what do you do? Again, you sit at the feet of Jesus and are obedient to His Word. And you know what you do? Pray. As we were reminded this morning, prayer is the great gift God has given us. It isn't with great words, complexity of thought. It is with the simple devotion. Lord, give me today what I need today. Keep me out of temptation. Your kingdom come. And the number one place it needs to come, here. Right? Here is where we need the kingdom to come. Here. It is tempting to think we need the kingdom to come out there. But the stories that Luke uses illustrate it is here in our hearts. How we view others and whether or not we are willing to sacrifice and submit to the teaching of Jesus and be obedient to be the blessing in the lives of people in need. And do we understand that the place our heart belongs is at the feet of the Master, listening to His Word, living in obedience to His teaching. Because the distractions will come. There are things that you have to do today. And there are things you'll have to do tomorrow. But give me today, Lord, what I need. Protect me so that I'm not led into temptation. And your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Have you heard anything this morning? as you sat at the feet of the Master. I believe wholeheartedly we are to be a people transformed by the saving power of Jesus. I believe we share more in common with the Samaritan than we want to admit. That we need a complete and utter transformation of character and identity. We are also supposed to be the representatives of that eternal kingdom. It isn't meant to just be for us. We are to be the ambassadors and representatives of the kingdom of God in the lives of people, the people whose life you touch. Each one of us will encounter people no one else in this room will. And we are meant to be the representative of the kingdom of Christ to that person. And the kingdom of Christ is supposed to be the compass by which we live our life. It tells us where to go, what to say, what to do. And unless we're willing to live in obedience to where Jesus is pointing, I don't think we'll really understand what it means to embrace the life that we're meant to live here and now. And if there are distractions, things that threaten to push out what you know is important, you better pray and sit at the feet of Jesus again, submitting your cares and your concerns before the only one who's in charge. It's that great moment 
If you get an audience with the king, what are you going to ask for? If you get a moment with the king whose word is law, what will you ask? Because we've been in the presence of the king all morning. And anything we ask for in his name, he says, will be done. It's a remarkable invitation. To remember we can submit our cares and concerns to the one who ordered the universe. And he asks something in return. Will you submit to me? He asks. The resident of the kingdom of God is sworn to live in obedience to the one who reigns. To the resurrected Messiah who lives eternal. And so in a season where people put up lights and trees and wreaths and celebrate the arrival of the king, I think we need to be thinking about what it means to live in recognition. He's already here. He already reigns. To believe and to dedicate ourselves again to the invitation of Jesus to make the kingdom of God our primary concern. To live each day at His feet and to submit only to what is important. The message of the King. To remind ourselves that we're not going to be swayed or distracted or coerced. We're not going to be tempted to live the old way. We're not going to get caught in that dead-end thinking. We're not going to beat ourselves up and tell ourselves we're not valuable because we know where we live. In the presence of the crucified and resurrected Messiah who gave His life so that you could live. Because we are a people who believe the truth of the message of Jesus, that He reigns eternally. If you don't know and understand all of what that means, you're in a place that there are people surrounding you who want to teach you and help you and encourage you to take hold of Jesus and His message today. To be baptized into His death and raised in His life. To be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live for God. And if you're a believer and you just need some people to help you today, to pray for you and encourage you, to remind you that you live in the presence of God and to feel His embrace again. We want you to know. We want to encourage you. Would you please stand together and sing with us?